Good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Glenn Pierce. I'm the Vice President for Medical for the World Federation of Hemophilia. And I'm here to talk about the voice of the patient, the peaks and valleys in the modern history of hemophilia. I um, appreciate the invitation and I'm sorry that I can't be here in person with you. My disclosures include the fact that I am a consultant for a number of different companies, both within the hemophilia gene therapy space and outside of the hemophilia gene therapy space. When we talk about the modern history of hemophilia, it really starts in the 1960s. Uh, and it starts with plasma-derived clotting factors, uh, which really became uh, the go-to treatment because immediately upon taking them, any bleeding episode would just stop immediately. It was an amazing thing uh, to witness. But however, they also contained hepatitis B, C, and HIV viruses uh, and uh, resulted in widespread viral contamination, death, and destruction within our community. That helped to usher in the era of recombinant clotting factors, which were first approved in the 1990s. They didn't have any risk of um, transmission of bloodborne pathogens, although by that time, neither did the plasma-derived clotting factors. Protein engineering improvements on the native clotting factors came along. The first extended half-life clotting factor was approved in 2014, and a number of others are also available. And then finally, um, by 2017, uh, the first of the novel platform therapies came along, a bispecific monoclonal antibody, emicizumab, um, for the treatment of hemophilia, and others such as small inhibitory RNA and gene therapies are in clinical trials. So these technological improvements were remarkable, but the more remarkable thing is the effect that they had actually on the treatment of hemophilia. So we went from on-demand therapy with the, with the clotting factor concentrates, plasma-derived, uh, to some prophylaxis. That got derailed with the AIDS crisis. Um, but then once that was uh, eliminated, more prophylaxis became, uh, became used, and it became the standard of care. And now with um, drugs such as the monoclonal antibody that I just mentioned, 24-7 coverage is possible. Uh, with more in clinical trials that potentially can achieve the same thing. Things really got started with an invention by Judith Graham Poole of cryoprecipitate. She left some fresh frozen plasma out on the counter to thaw and found a white, white fluffy precipitate in the, in the bag. She examined it and found that it was rich in factor eight. Uh, and that set the stage then for being able to use small amounts of, of um, factor eight containing uh, plasma uh, to control bleeding episodes. It set the stage for the beginning of modern treatment and the beginning of the plasma fractionation industry, uh, which got started in the mid-1960s. They began partial purification of clotting factors. Eventually, they, they weren't very pure at the beginning, but eventually they were nearly 100% pure by the late 1980s. Um, and they weren't virally inactivated at the beginning, but by the late 1980s, they were all virally inactivated. This is a picture of Murray Thalen from Highland Laboratories, which became Baxter and now Takeda. Uh, and um, he was a biochemist with hemophilia who did some of the first experiments to fractionate uh, plasma to make more purified factor eight and actually used it on himself. Uh, an article was written about him. He eventually, a few years after this, died from uh, an intracerebral hemorrhage, was, which was not uncommon at the time. And then here's a picture from Berkeley, Cutter Laboratories, which started as a vaccine at pharmacy uh, producer um, back in the World War I days and became an early plasma fractionator that later uh, became bare. Well, what's my connection? Well, I was born with severe hemophilia. Here I am at age 12 before having really any therapy. And one can see uh, badly damaged right knee, two ankles, and an elbow, um, all by the time I was 12. Many bleeding, significant bleeding episodes. Uh, here I am at summer camp on crutches with a brace to try to keep my legs straight. Here I am in a cast, um, also 
uh, to try to keep my legs straight in the hospital where I spent lots of time in childhood playing doctor, uh, and then in junior high, uh, continuing on crutches. Uh, my five minutes of fame, seven-year-old in the hospital for the 28th time. Uh, so that really was my childhood. Uh, we didn't have effective treatments. I took fresh frozen plasma, but it didn't really work because there wasn't enough concentration, concentrated factor eight in it. Uh, and so my childhood really was much of it spent in the hospital, uh, braces, casts, crutches. I was in a full-time wheelchair by the time I was 11, missed lots of school, all of seventh grade, half of 10th grade. And by then I was desperately searching for control. Physicians became my role models and I felt if you can beat them, join them and learn as much as I could about my disease so that I could try to get some control. Began a little bit of a research program by the time I was eight with my first microscope. And when I was 10, I wrote an autobiography while I was in the hospital and had one of the people in the playroom type it up while I uh, dictated it. It started off with, I've been to the hospital 37 times to date. And it finishes with, most likely I have a lot more hospital visits ahead of me. But if I can find a cure soon enough, I might just have a few more hospital visits ahead. When I grow up, if I get there, I plan to discover a cure for hemophilia if someone doesn't beat me to it. My other goal in life is to invent an anti-gravity belt. But, uh, one of those might be coming true. So by the mid-20s, I was on on-demand therapy. I was very active, uh, but I really became a poster child for why on-demand therapy didn't work. Here I am, uh, first nine months of 1980, so I would have been about 25. Uh, and you can see all the bleeds I had in my right ankle, all the bleeds in my left elbow. And what I didn't really appreciate at the time was that every one of those bleeds damaged my joint a little bit more, destroyed a little more cartilage, ate away at a little bit more bone. Uh, uh, and so it really, uh, it really is a case, uh, makes a good case for prophylaxis. I did reach my goal and went to both medical school and graduate school um, in the late 1970s, working in the lab and on the wards. Uh, and I wound up taking prophylaxis because I really didn't have any time to bleed during that time. It was a very active, active time. By uh, uh, happenstance and coincidence, I did my thesis research on a very backwater area of medicine, congenital immunodeficiency diseases like the boy in the bubble. And as I was finishing it, there was a new immunodeficiency identified in New York, LA, and San Francisco. And then a year later, in three individuals with hemophilia, plus an infant who received a blood transfusion. So it became clear there was a connection between blood and this new viral disease. By early 1983, that was established. All of us, many of us had abnormal T cells and we started dying from this disease. Some treatment centers switched back to cryoprecipitate. Um, if you did that in New York, that wouldn't have been such a good idea. If you did it in Milwaukee or Cleveland, where they did, um, it could have been a good idea and saved a few patients, but most of us were already infected by 1983. Surprisingly, we found a few things out, such as the fact that our clotting factor concentrates were made from the pooled plasma of up to 120,000 donors. A single person with hepatitis C or hepatitis B would contaminate the entire pool. So by 83, all the pools were contaminated, not only with hepatitis viruses, but HIV. It was a crazy precedent. How could a virus infect and then kill the majority of the people that it infected? And how could a person develop antibodies, which is supposed to signify immunity and not be immune? That was HIV. We started seeing horizontal and vertical transmission. In addition to our exponential death curves, our sexual partners and children began their own individual exponential death curves. By the first half of the 1990s, one person a day with hemophilia was dying. We woke up in the 1990s because of that, and uh, I became an advocate and an activist. I got involved in local politics with hemophilia, national hemophilia politics, and um, we demanded uh, that the industry and the government take responsibility for contamination of the U.S. blood supply. 
Um, we moved uh, toward pushing for an Institute of Medicine report on what went wrong, uh, finding accountability on the part of the government as well as industry. Uh, we got the Ricky Ray bill passed uh, in Congress to um, provide some small compensation from the government. Industry also provided some compensation. I got very involved in a number of government committees, and really the, the mantra was never again uh, should we uh, fall asleep at the wheel. Uh, as, a, uh, as a community, uh, um, with, the, um, uh, with the blood supply, it's a precious resource, but it needs, it needs strong safeguards. Um, by the mid to late 1990s, things turned around. We had highly active uh, therapy for HIV, and we began emerging from a really rough time. A lady named Marilyn Ness did a documentary that came out in 2010 that does a, a very good job of really talking about the fog of war uh, from HIV and it's available on Netflix, about 80 minutes. But for me, it wasn't, uh, the sequelae from the plasma-derived concentrates wasn't over. Um, I wasn't feeling so good in 2008. Um, I, my liver was going, uh, and I knew that it was progressive, wasn't going to get reversed, uh, and it was probably time to start thinking about what to do. I also knew that I had friends that got cadaver donors, donors from people who died. Uh, and uh, by the allocation system, they get them very late in their disease. And some of them didn't survive a major surgery like that. So I looked into living donors and my son was compatible and agreeable. Uh, so we both started getting worked up for a living donor transplant. But then I got an, uh, an unexpected surprise from University of California, San Francisco. They called, offered me a spot in a clinical trial if I uh, would participate, and they would give me a liver from a woman who died of a cerebral hemorrhage. So that was an easy decision to make. I could spare my son the surgery, and I would get the transplant the next day. It was a long recovery. But after a few months, I started having some good days. This is my liver, and it's an example of what a cirrhotic liver that can barely sustain life looks like. You can see that there's a little area of red, so there is some healthy liver in there, but the vast majority of it is not healthy. It's cirrhotic. So since 2008, every day has been a good day. And the added bonus is that since factor eight and factor nine are both made in the liver, if I get a liver from somebody who doesn't have hemophilia, my hemophilia is cured, except for the damaged joints. But I took care of those in 2014, 2015, 2020. And this gives you an example of what hemophilia can do when it's unchecked. Uh, this is my left knee. It had maybe one bleed in it. It's a nice, normal looking joint. Joint space, beautiful beautiful architecture. This is the right knee, lots of bleeds, no joint space, no synovial membrane, no cartilage, and then bone just being chipped away, bone on bone. And so that's an example of a joint that can be very, very painful. So what about my career? Well, I said I wanted to cure hemophilia, but I actually didn't go into that at the beginning of my career. The first 15, 16 years of my career, I worked in tissue regeneration, got involved in gene therapy for tissue regeneration, started my career at Amgen, where I learned drug development. Uh, and then by 2002, I really no longer got pleasure from tissue regeneration. All of my volunteer time was spent uh, working in hemophilia. So I decided that I would switch my career and do full-time hemophilia research and development. Since that period of time, I've had an opportunity to really contribute to some remarkable things. I became head of gene therapy at Avigen, which was a first-generation gene therapy company up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and worked on gene therapy for factor IX. We made some seminal discoveries with our academic partners. Um, and um, really set the stage, although we weren't successful, we set the stage for uh, the subsequent Factor IX clinical trials, which have been relatively successful over these last uh, 15 plus years. Um, I got involved in a development with a couple of friends uh, from the hemophilia community of a biosimilar Factor IX that came out in 2015 as Infinix. I worked with them in 2005 to get their company started. 
And then I got involved at Bear Healthcare and heading up some research on protein engineering of factor eight, which turned out to be Jivy, which got approved in 2017. Uh, and then in 2009, after my liver transplant, I felt like I had a new lease on life. And so um, I moved to Boston to head up uh, the hemophilia program at Biogen. And I took people with me from Avigen and Bayer who um, were scientists who, and clinicians who knew how to develop new hemophilia drugs. So we hit the ground running at Biogen. And within about five years, we saw the approval of the first FC fusions for factor eight and factor nine. When those got approved, I headed back to California uh, and worked with Genentech early on as they first developed their bispecific antibody, emicizumab. Um, and then I also worked closely uh, with Biomarin for about seven years on their AAV5 factor eight gene therapy program. Got involved at the very beginning in helping them to develop the phase one, two protocol. But something else happened when I left Biogen. I became a consultant, but I also was able to go back into volunteer work in hemophilia. One of the things we did at Biogen was to make a commitment to donate 1 billion units with our partners at SOBI uh, to the developing world over 10 years. And that's worth um, at market value about $3 billion worth of product. And so I joined with the WFH to help set that program up and distribute it. We're now treating 20,000 patients in about 70 different countries around the world and making a difference every day in the lives of those patients. We've been joined by other companies. CSL came on very early um, in 2010 timeframe uh, with donations. Griffles has been involved for a long time. Um, Bayer has committed uh, therapies um, uh, and um, Others are looking at, uh, at making that commitment, including Novo. So um, it's been a wonderful thing to see grow. Uh, and uh, actually, Roche with emicizumab has also uh, been donating uh, to the humanitarian aid program. So this really is my passion. Our mission at the WFH is to improve and sustain care for people with inherited bleeding disorders all around the world. But what does that mean? That means there should be over a million people with hemophilia in the world, but we've only found less than 200,000. What happened to the rest of them? Many have died. Uh, many have died in childhood. Some still are living in adolescence, even adulthood. I've met, I've met adults that have hemophilia that were never diagnosed, but you can tell from the way they walked and the way their joints looked that they were undiagnosed with hemophilia and managed to survive. Uh, and so there's a lot more work to be done to be able to find and treat more individuals with hemophilia around the world. The reality is people do die. Um, the lifespan is very low uh, if you don't have access to therapy. Uh, and if you do um, live, then you've got severe disability, crippling, uh, as well as pain. I have traveled around the world with the WFH to educate and train both patients as well as physicians on how to best use these clotting factors. Here we are in Bali with a whole supply of clotting factor concentrates that moms are coming to pick up to be able to do prophylaxis on their children back in their, uh, in their small, small towns and villages. And here we are in Pune um, where um, we're looking at an x-ray of a uh, a boy that got a synovectomy. This is before and this is after. Uh, under coverage of the clotting factor concentrates. And another boy who uh, had a rod inserted after a pseudotumor in his thigh uh, to stabilize his leg. Here I am talking with a lot of the parents um, that go to the treatment center in Pune. And here's all the kids who uh, Dr. Shashi Apti, who runs the treatment center there, uh, put on prophylaxis, uh, thanks to the humanitarian aid program. And this is Dr. Asad Hafar, who is the medical director at the WFH and who runs uh, the humanitarian aid program. He's been doing that uh, in one form or another for 20 years. And here's a young gentleman who, under coverage of the clotting factor concentrates, 
had significant reconstructive surgery in both of his legs uh, due to uncontrolled bleeding and pseudotumor formation. So when I think about where we are today, uh, and I look back over the last 60 years, I look at the, uh, the lack of progress that we've made in the developing world, we're in a remarkable place here in our high income countries. Uh, we have great factor replacement therapy. We have substitution therapy that's been on the market now for several years. Um, we have new factors that are in clinical trials that can remove the dependence of factor eight on its carrier, von Willebrand factor, and potentially, if the clinical trials bear out, get us easily to once a week dosing for factor eight uh, that will provide for high troughs. Uh, there's continued work to see if sub Q subcutaneous factor eight can be developed. We already have sub-Q with, um, with substitution train, uh, therapy. Um, and factor eight, of course, can be used for both prophylaxis and breakthrough bleeding. With the substitution therapy, factors required for the breakthrough bleeding, not the substitution therapy. That's only used prophylactically. We can do monitoring for factor eight, factor nine levels in the laboratory and with substitution therapy such as emicizumab, monitoring is not needed. But one of the most important things when we move the dosing out and eliminate the peaks and troughs is, is not having to worry, freedom from the constant concerns of hemophilia. And there's a lot to be said for that as well. So what about the future? Well, let's look at performance over time. Uh, and what we can see is that we had a major, major leap forward with the conventional clotting factors, which also remain so important in the low-income countries around the world. And then we saw the development of bypassing agents for inhibitors, finally something to treat them. Now we have continued improvements in treatments, such as emicizumab for inhibitor patients. Uh, and then the extended half-life products that came along uh, that provide for higher troughs, um, or less frequent uh, injections, or both. Uh, and then finally, the non-replacement factors, um, some of which are in the clinic, others such as emicizumab are on the market, 24-7 coverage, no troughs. And so amidst all of this then, we're still not quite at the cure, and gene therapy can be the means that get us to the end, which is the cure. And this would really be considered very disruptive technology, and in its best form would be curative uh, for both hemophilia A and hemophilia B. A lot's been written about these kinds of innovations and the fact that they come from different places, not just the market leaders. Uh, and here's a book written more than 20 years ago now by a professor at MIT. My son sent it to me about 12, 13 years ago called The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, it talks a lot about the tech industry and how um, the, uh, in the floppy disk to solid state hard drives, each new company ate the previous company's lunch and the previous company was unable to innovate. We've seen more innovation by some of the existing companies, but we've also in hemophilia, but we've also seen a lot of new companies come along that are able to break into the market because they may have a best in class kind of product um, or a first in class net innovative product. So let's keep the goal in mind. Uh, this is uh, an article that uh, this comes from an article written by um, a number of friends of mine, uh, headed by Mark Skinner. Um, both patients as well as uh, hemophilia care physicians. Uh, and what they do is they look at health equity uh, and the increments there um, as a function of, um, of uh, the level of protection. Uh, and so when we look at an absence of clotting factors, uh, we're looking for just for some survival. Uh, so that premature death can be prevented. But as we go up the curve, uh, it's being blocked here by my picture, which I guess I can move, okay. Um, our goal really is normal hemostasis, just like, just like somebody who doesn't have hemophilia. And that really sets the stage for optimized health and well-being. Um, but the road to get there really has to involve this functional cure. Uh, and what they say is that it not only achieves the goal of hemostasis, which would be transformative, but it eliminates any consideration of hemophilia in planning life, medical, or emergency care. And that's where, that's the end. 
That's the end that we need to get to. Gene therapy may get there for some patients, but for others, it won't. And so uh, this is still a work in progress to get to this goal. Oops. So I'll close with um, coming back to the, the huge dichotomy between, um, um, between the haves and the have-nots in the world. This is a picture some of you will recognize of the Tsarevich Alexis taken shortly before his assassination in 1917. Many of his pictures have his leg bent. And so we can imagine what's going on underneath those trousers. Same thing that was going on underneath my shorts there. Uh, this is a bad knee. It's been um, a target joint. It's had a lot of repeated bleeds uh, and it can't be straightened out. It's permanently permanently flexed, uh, just like the Zarbich is. So this is 50 years after the Zarbich. No appreciable progress uh, in the treatment of hemophilia. But the really sad part is 100 years after the Zarbich, here's a young man in uh, Kenya uh, and his knee is also bent. Uh, and so we know that he's had many bleeds in his knee, lots of pain and suffering, uh, and his knee is in a permanent state of flexure contracture. And so 100 years later, despite 60 years worth of innovation for the 15% of the world, 70% of the world has seen no innovation. And that's, that's where gene therapy comes in. Once we have a solid gene therapy products that we know work and are safe, uh, and work most of the time, uh, then the approach needs to go into the, into the developing world, into the low-income countries, and do a once-and-done kind of a therapy uh, so that we don't have to worry about getting clotting factor concentrate, getting them on prophylaxis. We don't have enough factor to get everybody in the developing world on prophylaxis. And there is probably not enough manufacturing capacity in the world to be able to get everybody on prophy. So we do need to be thinking of disruptive technologies if we're going to solve, uh, solve for hemophilia, better hemophilia treatment in uh, the majority of the world. With that, I'll thank you. And I believe there will be a question and answer period tomorrow. Get everybody started. I'm just going to ask you really quick. So I've been um, part of NHF's um, uh, state of science uh, conference, and, and I'm on their gene therapy uh, working group. And we've been talking a lot about um, emotions and what it's going to be like when, when and if there was a cure or through gene therapy, you know, people may not now have hemophilia or they're not going to be having as many bleeds or whatever. Being someone in your space all those years uh, living with hemophilia, I'd love for you to share just a quick what was that like to all of a sudden one day you have hemophilia, the next day you are actually cured? What was that like? Or how, how do you deal with that emotions, I guess? Emotions run high. It was an indescribable feeling, although I will try to describe it. Uh, it's, um, it's night and day. It's, uh, it's, it's, going, it's going from a situation where I don't know about others who are living with hemophilia, but for me, it was a 24 seven affair because every moment of every day, I was reminded of my hemophilia. I have lots of, of damaged joints. And so with every step I take, with every movement I take, I feel that, and that's a constant reminder. I still feel that today, but it's no longer a reminder that I might be bleeding because that's really what the reminder was. Oh, I feel this pain here. Uh, did I do something? Uh, what might I have done? Is it bleeding? Is it not bleeding? How do I make a decision on that? All of that goes through your mind. It's almost part of the subconscious when you're living with a disease like hemophilia. Um, when you lose it, um, it's a gradual thing uh, to not worry about it, but, um, but it's something you can become accustomed to very easily. I can remember a few months after my liver transplant, I banged my knee into a bedpost and I thought, oh, I've got to go get some, some concentrate to take. And then I thought, no, I really don't have to do that. And so there were situations where I would, I, I would clearly have bled. Um, if, um, if I had hemophilia, and I didn't. And so those kinds of revelations um, 
uh, after you have a few of them or enough of them, uh, then it becomes more, more commonplace. So here I am, what, 13, 13 or so years past the transplant. Um, and it's, it's too bad I don't feel that, that, um, that kind of joyousness that I had in the one or two years immediately after the transplant where things were just so different. I'm still very appreciative, obviously, and I, I very much ha am happy that I, I no longer bleed. Um, but um, that newness, um, the newness of it is, is gone a little bit. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm going to mute myself. Would anyone like to ask a, a question? I've got one. Um, hi, I'm Michelle. Uh, I have a almost two-year-old with severe hemophilia. And during your presentation, it caught my eye that you helped with the development of Hem Libra. Um, and I was wondering if you might be able to speak any. Um, so like I said, my son is almost two and I love this stuff. People will pry it out of my cold dead hands. Like it is amazing for what it does for him prophylactically. But anytime anything weird happens to him, I'm like, is the hem Libra doing something it's not supposed to be doing? And I think if I knew more about the, like when they decided it would be okay to give it to children, like what, cause it was originally studied in adults, right? Like not children who were still growing and developing. So like that sort of, um, if I knew more about how they decided it's safe to give to kids, I think I could like calm down a little bit. Well, it was studied in children. Uh, actually, uh, there is um, at least one New England Journal paper, a Lancet paper on clinical trials in children, and then there have been lots of subsequent papers on on studying this in children. So, uh, it's it's had a tremendous amount of experience in children, and now that it's been on the market for for uh, years or so, um, uh, even more even more children have have been exposed to it. And, and so we do have a system really around the world that tries to capture adverse events. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a perfect system by any means, but uh, given, given that we've, we've probably got, I'm not quite sure the number, but I would say that it's close to 10,000 people taking Heme Libra, and that mm -hmm. includes infants who are newly born all the way to older adults. Um, if we were if we were going to see anything significant uh, in terms of adverse events, um, we would have seen it by now. It, uh, but it's, so it went on market on 2017, right? So like we haven't actually see, like we there hasn't been enough time for like full longitudinal data for developments for children, right? Well, I would say that there there's enough time. First of all, in terms of development, there there isn't even a hypothesis you could generate mm -hmm. that would say that this would affect development. So, mm -hmm. you know, unless you can have a little bit of a scientific basis for testing something, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not something that, um, that you should worry about. It, we've, had, we've had kids on study since probably 2015, 14, something okay. like that. Um, and, and so um, it's in the clinical trials, it certainly has been tested over a long period of time in children. There's been a lot of intensive scrutiny on heme Libra because it, it is such an effective drug for inhibitor patients, for severe factor eight patients. Uh, and, and as a result of that, it's under the microscope. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm really not too concerned that that there's a problem with heme Libra. There's, you can, you can always make one up and, and the competitors, you know, and, and in all fairness, that's some of the things that irritate me about marketing because you'll have competitors in this space that'll say, oh, what about this? What about that? Mm -hmm. And you know, that's not a good thing to do to the, the hemophilia community. You know, let's, let's play fair about this uh, because with any drug, there are can always be a side effect, including mm -hmm. our clotting factor concentrates, starting with the plasma-derived clotting factors that contaminated the entire community to the recombinant factors where there may occasionally be an allergic reaction. So I, I think that we need, to, we, we need to be balanced about this. And unfortunately, uh, all the competitors in this space don't, don't always play fairly. Right. 
right. um, this is oh, Jane. I was going to say, April had her hand up, so her next, and then James will follow up with you. Um, if this is not too personal, uh, I know a lot of times after you have um, transplants of, of organ transplants, you have to be on lots of medication, or you have to be on medication for like some sometimes for life. Now, do you have to be on a medication for life? I mean, is, you know, yeah. like, so you traded one disease basically for an, another type of medicine? Well, I did, um, but... Um, in, in my particular situation, I, I wasn't going to survive with the liver that I was born with. And so that's not, that's not much of a decision when it comes to a trade. Oh, yeah, I understand that. And, and so we have, we have lots of people that have had all kinds of organ transplants, kidneys, hearts, livers. Um, and, and just about everybody needs to stay on the transplant medicine for life. Um, what, what I think is important is that you can bring the doses down. So the doses that I was on uh, immediately after the transplant, I'm on about 1 20th of that dose now. And so many of those side effects uh, don't, don't affect you over the long term if you're able to bring the doses down. James, I think you had yeah. a question. Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I listened to your presentation last night, which I was rather... Um, well, I was touched and moved, and I, and uh, maybe because I I saw someone of my generation. Uh, I think we may be about I'm 62. You would have looked like you about 62, 63 years old. Yeah, 66. And, oh, okay, well, okay. You held up. <laughs> you held up well. Who would have thought? You know, I never expected to be here. Yeah, but I guess to hear that history and uh, and see photos of your, you know, of your. Uh, of, of your youth and, you know, when you was 12 year old and so forth. Uh, my question is, um, now the bleeds that you had as a young person, were those as a result of, um, of trauma from, you know, doing things or did you just woke up a lot of mornings and, and there was bleeding? They started off as trauma. Um, you know, I fell on my my left elbow when I was two and a half, and that just set off a cascade of hundreds and hundreds of bleeding episodes afterward. I fell on my right knee when I was about five, and that did the same thing. Uh, so, yeah, so there was, you know, the usual trauma of childhood. Yeah, okay, all right. Because I, um, I and my brothers, um, likewise, I mean, one of my, bro my brothers close to me with, um, with hemophilia, God rest his soul, I guess a lot of the, um, I guess a lot of the traumas that I guess growing up as a child, somehow or another, I'm not sure we have, we certainly didn't evade all of them, but it was none that was um, that that left us with a uh, with a I guess a joint that was that was uh, affected for long term. But my younger brother, uh, God rest his soul, is like he was just always injured always swollen or something and it's like okay is he is he worse than i mean is, is there i know that there's severe and then there's moderate and so forth and, and all of us were diagnosed as severe but his severe was a lot different than my severe and my uh, other brother's uh, severe and so i i just just whether he just woke up many mornings Maybe it was just he was just lying to my mother a lot that he he hadn't done something that he really did do, and so now his elbow or his ankle or his knee or whatever was out. But um, but I I, I um I said, I'd certainly thank you for all that you have done um, in this in this community in this industry um, going back so many years because like I, said, I remember the '60s and the '70s myself and um, and. And it was a grueling time for uh, for myself. I was the first in my family. Well, I'll take that back. I wasn't the first. I didn't. My grandfather actually had hemophilia, but I didn't. It didn't dawn on me till I was in my forties that he, that he had lived with hemophilia. I don't know why, but it just didn't. But yeah, he had. You know, he had come along in the thirties and the forties with it, and so I can. And so by the time I met, I guess by the time I was born, I. His, his knee was already fused and he was having these bleeding tongue bleeds and so forth. And, and certainly as a child, I didn't know. 
what was going on. But as an adult, I don't know why it just went right over my head that my grandfather had hemophilia. But you know, anyway, thank you. All right, you're welcome. And what you're describing is, um, is a situation where all of you in the family have exactly the same mutation, uh, and yet you bled differently. And that's, that's a pretty common observation. Uh, and it's because there's a lot of other proteins that are involved in the coagulation cascade. And so um, you might have had a little extra coagulation, even though you didn't have any factor eight. And your brother might have had a little less coagulation, plus he didn't have any factor eight. And so that can cause him to bleed more spontaneously than you. And, and that's, that's a pretty common observation in families. All right, anybody have another question? I have one. Uh, it, it looks like the you know, future for uh, curing hemophilia will be you know, uh, gene therapy. And in your video, you said, you know, we will never be able to produce enough factor to cover the whole world. How are we going to get the gene therapies to the remotest parts of India, the remotest parts of China, yeah. remotest parts of Russia? Is that, are we, are we at the point yet where we're thinking about that kind of infrastructure? Or are we just like, let's get to gene therapy first and then we'll get to how we'll distribute it you know, across the world? For the most part, most everyone is thinking about the latter. Let's, let's figure out how to get gene therapy approved in North America and Europe. Uh, and, and go from there. Um, it, at the WFH, the World Federation of Hemophilia, I spend a lot of time thinking about how we're gonna get it to uh, low income countries, low middle income countries. So there's a whole classification of countries throughout the world. We live in a high income country, um, no surprise. Uh, and for us, um, healthcare is almost unlimited. Um, is, in fact, it's much more unlimited than if you go to Canada or, or Europe. Uh, where there are restrictions on what you can and cannot access, either in terms of physicians or in terms of medicines. We have almost no restrictions at all in the United States, and we're fortunate for that. Um, but elsewhere in the world, of course, the restrictions are very, very high. Uh, how are we going to get it there? I, I don't know, Greg. Uh, um, but if we don't start talking about it now, it's not gonna happen in 20 or 30 years. And so we, we need to keep that conversation alive. We need to be thinking about it. At the WFH, we're collaborating with St. Jude's Children's Hospital to start a small clinical trial with AAV Factor 9 in three countries, three low middle income countries where they've got some infrastructure, but they really don't have any treatment uh, to speak of. And so this is going to mean a huge world of difference for those sm that small number of patients who are able to access the Factor 9 gene therapy. And so it's a pilot to see how workable is that? Can we actually deliver gene gene therapy in these low middle income countries successfully without running into problems? Can we monitor the patients successfully and have them have a successful outcome with which would be some therapeutic constant level of factor nine uh, that, that relieves them of the need for needing replacement therapy, which they don't have access to. Uh, so that's an experiment in progress. Um, and I think that we'll see other experiments. I know that um, that um, at least one of the companies that's getting closer to approval has talked about um, pilots that they might do in one or two or three low-income countries, uh, such as in Africa. Uh, and so um, we need to, we, we as a community need to pressure them to do that. We need to remind them of that. We need to ask them about that. We need to tell them we support them doing that. And that's the sort of thing that will continue to drive this transfer, it, it doesn't cost very much to make gene therapy, despite what they might tell you. And, and so relatively speaking, to make it, um, sure, it costs more than recombinant factor, but, but over the period of, of time, it really doesn't cost that much to make it. And so if you're able to give it a single time and have it last for many years, um, it really winds up being very cost effective. What's not cost effective is if you decide to sell it for $2 million a dose. 
you know, then it takes it completely out of the range of anyone in a country other than an extremely high income country like ours. Great, thank you. Does anybody have I want one last question? I see Dr. Uh, Young is on, so we're going to get ready to get him up in a few minutes. But one last question: Does anybody does anybody else have any questions? I have one for him. If if you guys don't, I don't see anybody. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Pierce. Can you also just give us a brief um, how important it is for us and our voice to continue to advocate for the access to gene therapy, their access to therapies? Uh, the importance to that, to get that, who's going to pay for this. Um, that's a lot of our, we do a ton of advocacy work uh, with NHF and within HFA and of course our own, own organization. How are we going to get insurance companies or others to help us pay for that? Um, and I think that's one of our biggest questions when we're always fighting just even for our own factor. Well, I think continued advocacy is going to be very important. Um, a lot of studies have, have started or have, have even finished that demonstrate the, the relative cost effectiveness of gene therapy if in fact it lasts for a long period of time. Uh, and so um, working through the logic of that uh, with the insurance companies is going to be important at multiple levels, um, at the patient advocacy level, at the, at the healthcare provider level, uh, and um, even, um, uh, even nationally um, with the national organizations uh, to make sure they understand. Um, they don't always understand. Uh, I know that in other, other disease states, um, take multiple sclerosis, for instance, which I've got some familiarity with, a much better drug and a less better drug cost the same amount of money, and yet insurance companies say you have to start with the less effective drug before we take you to the higher effective, even though it's the same exact amount of money. So to me, that's a failure of advocacy. Uh, and, and so we need to be aware of that. We are a very strong advocacy community. Uh, and so just making sure that regardless of what the price is for gene therapy, relative to the price of the uh, recombinant clotting factors prophylactic therapy, um, if it lasts for a long period of time, and I define long by at least 10 years, I hope a lot longer than that. For factor nine, it may be longer. Then I think that, that we just need to hit them over the head with the fact that it's cost effective. And by getting patients to a level above the troughs that one has with replacement factors and prophylaxis, one is bound to eliminate the, uh, the breakthrough bleeding. And, and so that's good for joint health, right? Perfect. I appreciate that. All right. Well, we've taken up enough of your time. I, I, I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, everybody unmute and give this man a well, well applause for being with us and for just all the work that you've done for the community. Uh, just keep pushing us through. And, and I hope one day we do find a cure, a, a true cure. And uh we can get rid we of really all together. I, I appreciate will. you. It'll all just right. take some time. All right. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye -bye.